Um, okay, so uh, we're just going to quickly skip through the stuff that we went over at the end of last lecture. So that video is now online, and I've redone the the, um, the residence time video, so that should work now. Um, and it also has a picture of a fluffy dog in it, if you like fluffy dogs, um, for literally no reason, um, but it's there. Um, so we're going to be talking about the ocean carbon cycle today, and we've kind of already gone over this, so the ocean carbon cycle is, contains quite a large kind of reservoir of carbon, okay, but you can split up the ocean into different boxes, we went through that yesterday, um, and we can, uh, it's not, we'll go over the different kinds of carbon that are actually dissolved in the ocean, so quite a lot today we're going to be talking about this dissolved inorganic carbon fraction, okay, so this is the, the inorganic dissolved carbon species. Whereas the, the things that make up kind of the organic matter is a relatively small component of the total carbon dissolved in the ocean, or the total carbon in the ocean, sorry. Um, and then we went over this concept of uh, Henry's law, which determines basically the, the relative concentrations of gas in the overlying atmosphere and in the water. Okay? Um, and that is dependent on temperature. And we kind of finished. There. So, but the, the important thing is you can see here that in the, this is a map of the flux of CO2 across the ocean atmosphere interface. Okay, and you can see here that uh, in the cold regions of the, of the world, so near the Southern Ocean, the North Pacific and North Atlantic up there, okay, there's a flux into the ocean. Okay, so there's basically this, this, the scale here is the flux out. So a negative is the flux into the ocean, and that's because these regions are cold, so they can absorb more CO2, whereas when the warm water upwells in the uh, tropical regions, okay, it can't hold as much CO2, okay, so it's like opening a warm can of fizzy pop. Uh, so all that gas, not all of the gas, but lots of that gas comes out of the ocean in the tropics. Okay? So there's this kind of feedback between temperature and the capacity of the ocean to store carbon dioxide. Okay, and that's what kind of most of today's lecture will be on. Okay, so we're going to look. Uh, we're going to look now at this. Uh, this what happens when we have this kind of first dissolution, where we start to take stuff from the atmosphere down into the ocean. Okay, so it's not just a dissolution of a gas. Into a um, into 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 like a dissolved aqueous phase in the liquid, so there is this chemical reaction that happens. Um, so at the top here, carbon dioxide and water, okay, they they, don't, they don't, the the CO two doesn't just dissolve in the water. It's not just hanging out in between the water molecules. It actually reacts with it to form this species in blue here, this H two CO three, which is carbonic acid. Now that that species there actually doesn't really, I mean, it does exist in a very, very small concentration in the ocean, but it, that acid rapidly disassociates, okay? So you can kind of think of, 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 of the, the, um, the, if you added up the total dissolved CO2 aqueous and the carbonic acid, okay, if you added those up, that would be almost identically equal to the concentration of CO2 dissolved, okay, because the concentration of carbonic acid is so small, and it's small because as soon as it forms, it breaks apart, okay, and it breaks apart into these much more stable uh, ions bicarbonate, which is the HCO3 minus, and that releases a hydrogen ion, and the carbonate ion, okay, CO3 2 minus, and that also releases a hydrogen ion. So I'm just going to kind of demonstrate what happens when we do that, but my safety specs super dangerous. Okay, so um, I poured out some uh, tap water into this uh, little doobie here, and you can read off what the pH is, right? Yeah? 6.26, 6 I think. So what I'm going to do now, so, um, so this is a soda stream, which is, um, I guess, from the 70s. Um, Okay. So all this does is so I'm just taking the same water. Okay, and in here there's a canister of CO2, so I'm just adding. Okay, so 
I've just added CO2 to that water. Okay? So the pressure in here is now really quite high. Okay? So there's some CO2 in the headspace up here, and there's some CO2 dissolved in the water down here. Okay. So what I'm going to do... So this is made lovely, lovely fizzy water. Which I'm going to pour... Okay, so we can now, well, first of all, I'm just going to put some, put some, so this is pH indicator, methyl orange, and it's not such a great indicator, but hopefully I can convince you that that one's kind of yellow, and that one's kind of orange, okay? So what's happened here is that it's the same water, and we can put the, put our, takes a while to do its thing. We can put that in there now, and you can see that the pH is now 5 point something, 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 okay? So we've acidified the water by adding CO2, okay? So that's what's happening in this equation up here. So you can see by adding CO2, okay, we form these guys over here, okay? These carbonate ions and bicarbonate ions. So how much did the pH change by? 1 point some unit. So you know pH is a log scale. Yeah? You should have done that with Brian. So that means we've actually created a whole load of these things over here. Loads and loads of bicarbonate and loads and loads of carbonate ions. Okay? In addition to these hydrogen ions that we're all kind of like pumping out there. Okay? So it turns out when you um, dissolve CO2 in kind of natural waters, in the ocean and in kind of river waters and things like that, most of the carbon is actually not as dissolved CO2, it's actually as the bicarbonate ion. Okay, so this is HCO3 minus. Okay. So we have this term, to, to, when we think about how much total carbon is dissolved in the ocean, okay, we have this term called total CO2, okay, which is kind of a little bit confusing because it's not the CO2, it's the CO2 plus the, the bicarbonate ion and plus the carbonate ion. So it's, the sum of all of the carbon bearing species is sometimes referred to as uh, total CO2, or sometimes this sigma CO2, which is kind of just mathsing up a little bit, um, and quite often referred to as total dissolved inorganic carbon, okay? Um, which has got this kind of quite hilarious dick acronym, okay? But the important thing for us considering fluxes in and out of the ocean is that the only one of these chemical species that can interact with the atmosphere is the carbon dioxide, the aqueous carbon dioxide. Okay, so this is, these, are, these, are, these equations at the top are just different ways of writing out that, that same long one. Okay, so there are, there are actually separate chemical reactions. So the first one is the, the reaction, well actually there's, a, there's one that's missing up here because it's there, the dissolution of kind of a gaseous phase into an aqueous phase, so CO2 gas goes to CO2 aqueous is actually a chemical reaction, but I've missed that one out here. So there's a chemical reaction where CO2 reacts with water to form this um, carbonic acid, and that rapidly disassociates. So the, the next two reactions are disassociation reactions where CO2, where, where uh, carbonic acid breaks apart, releases a hydrogen ion, which we've seen down at the front with the uh, lovely, lovely acidy thing, okay? And then that happens again to form the carbonate ion. So, because those disassociations, okay, because each, each time you break apart the carbonic acid to form bicarbonate and hydrogen ion, because that reaction has a hydrogen ion in it, okay, you can imagine if you had, if you change the pH of the solution, okay, you would change where the equilibrium point of those reactions are. So, if you added lots of hydrogen ions, okay, so if you dumped loads of acid into the ocean, okay, you would drive the, um, the equilibrium okay, towards there being less of the, the products, okay, because you're basically adding products, so it drives the reaction towards the reactants. Okay? So if we add hydrogen ions, if we lower the pH, that means we should have relatively more CO2 than we have bicarbonate ion, than we have uh, carbonate ion. Okay? 
So this is quite a neat uh, system because it means that not only so, so the pH determines what the, the proportions of the different species we have. So this, this graph is kind of slightly complicated to understand, but I just... So at any one pH, so say a pH, pH of 9, okay, we would have, uh, say, maybe 50% would be of the carbonate ion, we'd have another 50% would be the bicarbonate ion, and almost none would be dissolved CO2. Okay? Whereas at pH 7, we'd have maybe 1 or 2% of carbonate ion. Okay? We'd have much more bicarbonate ion, and that's because the low pH, that means it's got more hydrogen ions, has pushed the equilibrium of those reactions towards having more of this and a little bit of CO2. Okay? So this system means that... Um, this, 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 this basically this double disassociation means that the, the, um, the, the amount of each different species is pH dependent, but it also works the other way round. In that if we, if we force the system to, to have, if we start pumping loads and loads of CO2 into the system, okay, that forces the reaction kind of the other way towards trying to have more of the, these things over here, the, um, the carbonate and the bicarbonate ion, um, and that drives the pH, okay, to a higher value because you're, um, or sorry, to a lower value because you're you're adding all of these hydrogen ions. Now, the effect of having all of these things is that it kind of buffers any change. So, if you, did you do buffer acid base buffer reactions with with Brian? No. Oh well. Um, Kind of, kind of move on from that then, but because uh, that, that's not so important if you didn't cover it. But this is the kind of the point I was going to make. So in the ocean, because we have these three species of dissolved inorganic carbon, okay, only the CO2 species can interact with the atmosphere, okay. So that means that we've got an enormous kind of store of bicarbonate iron and um, this. I don't know why the at four degrees C is there. That should Ignore that for now. That will come up later. Um, and carbonate ions. So we've got an enormous stock of carbon in the ocean that can't interact with the atmosphere. Okay? So this allows us to store more and more carbon in the ocean. Okay? Okay, so let's just go through and see if we can kind of like, if you can kind of go through and kind of like account for this kind of stuff with maths. Uh, it kind of like checks that we kind of understand what's going on. Okay, so there's the four degrees C that you kind of like popped up earlier for, for just shits and giggles. Okay, so at four degrees C, the solubility constant, so remember back to Henry's law, okay, uh, is three grams of, of carbon, or three grams of carbon dioxide per kilogram of water. So in one kilogram of water, you can dissolve three grams of carbon dioxide if you have one atmosphere pressure of carbon dioxide. So that means if the, the, it was the same pressure as kind of this room, but it was made up entirely of CO2. Okay? So we know that that's not the case. The concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is 400 parts per million. Okay? So we're 400 divided by a million times less okay, should be dissolved in the, um, in the ocean. Okay? So that's 3 times 0.0004. So the ocean should have a concentration of 1.2 milligrams of CO2 per kilogram of water. Okay? So we can convert that into the number of moles per kilogram by dividing by 44, which is the molecular mass of, of CO2, which you definitely should have covered with uh, how to convert between moles and kind of kilograms mass with, uh, with Brian. Okay, so that's the concentration in terms of the molar concentration of CO2. The ocean is very big. Okay, so to work out the total amount of carbon dissolved in the ocean, we times the mass of the ocean by its concentration. Okay, and that's what's going on with this kind of thing here. So this gives us kind of the number of moles of CO2 in the ocean, which is 3.74 times 10 to the 16, kind of a number that's quite hard to get your head around. Um, so we're going to convert that into grams of carbon. Okay, so we just times by 12, because that's the atomic mass of carbon. Okay, so always kind of try and keep 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 in mind of when you're converting between CO2 or mass of CO2 and mass of carbon, 
Okay, there's a factor of kind of 12 over 44 to, um, to worry about. But um, we can do that, and that gives us uh, 40, 448 gigatons of carbon in the ocean. Okay? Now, that's not enough, because from the previous slide, we knew that it was 38,000. Okay? So the actual is 38,000. And the reason for that is because only 1% of the carbon in the ocean is as the CO2, and the other 99% is as dissolved bicarbonate ions and carbonate ions. So when you account for that, you say, well, I'm going to you know, count the other 99%, that gives us 4,400 uh, 4, gigatons of carbon. Okay? So that's kind of about right. So this number and that number are kind of the same. Okay? So, we think we can, so this kind of rough and ready approximate calculation kind of like helps us kind of understand why the stock of carbon in the ocean is so large. It's because only a small portion of the carbon can interact with the atmosphere. Okay, so that's kind of this, this thing. So just to zoom in on the back, so only this 448 gigatons of carbon is the stuff that's interacting with the atmosphere. Okay? Uh, and you can see that it's kind of gigaton, 750 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere now. So you can see how soluble Okay, so the CO2 is in the, um, in the ocean. Um, but we've got this huge stock that's basically hidden away from the atmosphere because it's in a different chemical form. Okay, so one of the things that we might want to think about, there's that 4 degrees C again. This is some, one of the assumptions that we made in that calculation was that all of the interaction with the uh, ocean happens at 4 degrees C. Okay? And now I made that assumption because most of the, the, well, the, the deep ocean is actually connected to the atmosphere only at high latitudes near the polar regions where deep water can sink from the surface down into the ocean. Okay, we'll go over that in a bit. But if, if that assumption is wrong, if, it's, if we do the average for the whole ocean, maybe it's a little bit warmer, makes CO2 a little bit less soluble, okay, we might come down to um, this 38,000 gigatons of carbon. So just to point out that when you're doing these rough and ready calculations, you make some kind of, kind of really broad brush assumption. Try and think about whether that assumption makes it your answer bigger than it should be or smaller than it should be, okay? Because it kind of like helps you understand where you uh, where your um, where your where the where the weaknesses in your, all of your assumptions are. Okay, so to summarise that little part there, the uh, um, temperature and pH, the the temperature and the concentration in the atmosphere determine how much carbon can go into the ocean. Okay? But only the CO2 interacts with the atmosphere, and you can store much, much, much more um, carbon in the ocean because it's held in these different chemical species. Okay? And the proportions you get are dependent on the pH. Okay? And we'll come on to this term buffered by alkalinity in a bit. Okay? That means. okay, so if we look into the deep ocean, if we measure the dissolved inorganic carbon down into the ocean, okay, we... Uh, we get a profile that looks a little something like this. Okay? So it's lower in the surface ocean than it is in the deep ocean. I should point out the scale on the bottom of here. Okay? It doesn't go to zero in the surface ocean. Okay? And it doesn't go to zero because the surface ocean is always in equilibrium with the atmosphere. So you can't deplete completely the carbon in the, in the surface ocean. But something's causing the concentration to, to increase at depth. Only slightly, so out of, kind of it's gone, gone up by about a factor of 300 micromoles per kilogram, okay, out of 2,000. Okay, so it's like a maybe a 15% increase. Yeah, let's, let's say a 15% increase, roughly. Okay, so what's going on here is we're moving carbon around to these different boxes in the ocean. Okay? So we can equally equilibrate the surface ocean with the, with the atmosphere. That's what determines the concentration at the surface of the ocean, but then we have these fluxes of carbon between the surface ocean, marine biota, and the deep ocean. Okay? And these can cause changes in, in the concentration. Okay, so you remember that the surface ocean is kind of stratified, okay, so it's nice and buoyant at the top, and that's also where the life is. Okay? So it's very hard to, to mix between the, the, the surface layer and the deep layer, okay? because the surface layer is really buoyant and sits on top and it can't kind of sink down. Okay, so uh, there are kind of like some exceptions to that. So at the, at the north, uh, near the, near, in the North Atlantic, 
around Iceland and in the Labrador Sea, which is uh, Labrador Sea, so in regions up here, okay, the surface water can get quite cold, okay, because it loses heat from evaporation, that's why Scotland's so wet, um, and that makes the water a little bit denser than it would all normally be, and it can kind of sink to the bottom of the ocean. Similarly, down in the, around Antarctica, you get interactions with the ice sheets there and sea ice, which can cause densification of the water. So loss of, um, you basically freeze out fresh water, makes the water saltier, um, and it can sink to the bottom. And you also lose heat to the atmosphere um, there as well, so it gets cold as well. So if we look at a section of the ocean, so now we're basically taking a vertical slice down through the ocean from Iceland down to, um, let's say, the Falkland Islands, um, controversially. Um, and you can see here that, that there are two places where CO2 is basically going. Uh, so that the, the colours on this are contoured for the concentration of dissolved inorganic carbon. Okay, so you can see the surface values are kind of purple. So that's low. Okay. And then the water sinks down, and we have lower concentrations at depth here than we would otherwise normally have. Okay? Um, so this, this carbon goes down into the deep ocean, and we can kind of like take stuff from the polar regions where it's cold down towards the tropics and the deep ocean. Okay? But there's still another process going on here because the whole of the deep ocean okay, is got a much higher concentration than the surface ocean. Okay, so that's kind of probably the, the most primary observation we can see. Okay? But you can also see the, the, the signature that we're moving water from the North Atlantic with a low total carbon down underneath water from the Antarctic that's got a higher carbon content. Okay? So we're still, we were able to advect water around and have changes in concentration. And that's because the residence time of carbon in the ocean is shorter than the mixing time. And if you watch the video that, that I've now made twice, because uh, well, you'll, you'll see that that's how, why that is. Okay, so we're going to look now why there's this broad brush kind of increasing concentration at depth. Okay, so why has the surface ocean got less carbon in the, the deep ocean? And it's because of these fluxes between this buoyant surface layer and the deep ocean. So it's hard to mix between the two, but there is a way of transferring carbon between the two, and that's mostly through the action of this marine biota. So it's a very small component, okay, it's three gigatons of carbon compared to the 1,000 gigatons of carbon that's actually dissolved in the surface ocean, okay? but it has fluxes that are going down into the deep ocean, okay? and only down. Okay? So there's no, no return flux. The only return flux is basically a mixing process, okay? and mixing by definition, moves things both ways. Okay. So, um, oh, that's, this is the conveyor belt. So this is, this is basically a pattern of moving back to how we could see the water sinking in the North Atlantic and moving down through the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, the, the ocean circulation kind of follows this really broad brush, cartoony pattern, where water sinks in the North Atlantic and basically then fills up the rest of the ocean deep basins. So if you, if you put something in the North Atlantic, it will eventually make its way um, back out into, the, um, uh, into the, the surface in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. And this, this process takes kind of, um, it says 500 years here, but that's massively wrong. It's, you know, on average, it's about 2,000 to 2,500 years. Okay, so we're now looking um, at some of these transfers between the deep ocean and the surface ocean. So you can see uh, these regions in red where we're getting carbon that is um, being added from the ocean to the atmosphere. And that's happening because the deep ocean that's got more CO2 dissolved in it, okay, that's being brought up to the surface. Okay? And it's being brought up to the surface by processes called upwelling, which is very simply that the wind blows, okay, it moves the surface ocean away, okay, either from the coastline or actually it can move stuff away from the equator, and the details of that are not so important for this course, but you'll, you know, if you want to learn more about that, oceanography will, will hook you up. Um, and if you move the surface ocean away, that allows the deep water to kind of upwell up into that space. Okay? And that brings high concentration surface water into contact with the atmosphere, so you can have this flux out. So not only are these regions giving out CO2 because they are warm, Okay? But they're giving out CO2 because they're upwelling deep water. 
Okay? And you can see an example of that up in the far north Pacific where it's not warm at all. So that flux of CO2 out of the, the ocean is due to um, just the upwelling of carbon-rich water from the deep ocean. Okay? So that's this upwelling flux, this kind of like 100 flux here in the middle. That's bringing up water to the surface ocean that's got a higher CO2 concentration. Okay, but we still haven't explained why it's got a higher CO2 concentration in the first place. Okay? And that's because of these fluxes over here. Sorry. So this is the fluxes of basically stuff, animals and plants that live in the ocean, okay, are exporting carbon from the surface ocean to the deep ocean. And they do that because they form biomass, they form um, kind of cells, clumps of organic matter, and that sinks. And when it sinks, Okay, it goes out of the surface ocean into the, the, the deep ocean underneath. And when it's there, bacteria start respiring that organic matter and turning it back into CO2. Okay? And as soon as it's CO2, it reacts with the water. Okay? And dependent on the pH of the water, it then apportions into those um, carbonates and bicarbonate species. Okay? Which is kind of you know, simply uh, schematically shown in this, this diagram here. So in the surface ocean at the top, Okay, stuff happens, you get like lots of biology happening, lots of life. That dies and sinks, okay, and forms uh, particulate organic matter, which breaks apart into dissolved organic carbon, okay, bio goo, basically. Uh, and then that organic matter, okay, reacts with oxygen that's dissolved in the water, okay, and that is not just a, an inorganic reaction, that is mediated by um, bacteria, using this for energy. Okay, and that releases CO2. And as soon as you release CO2 into the water, that reacts with the water and then gets locked away into this kind of dissolved inorganic carbon pool. Okay, which is those reactions there. Okay, and not only does this person, pro person? Ah, process add dissolved inorganic carbon, so it's adding CO2, it's adding um, a bicarbonate, and ultimately also uh, carbonates to the deep ocean, it's also adding hydrogen ions to the deep ocean. So the more this process goes on, the lower the pH of the ocean will get. So it's acidifying the deep ocean. Okay? So if you acidify the deep ocean, that changes what proportions of the dissolved inorganic carbon species you have. So the lower the pH, you'll have relatively more dissolved CO2, okay, and less carbonate ion, less bicarbonate ion, so when that water upwells, not only will there be more dissolved inorganic carbon, okay, proportionally more of it will be in the CO2 aqueous phase, which means more of it will be able to interact with the atmosphere. Okay? So that's kind of like a bit of a double whammy for when deep water upwells, that's why it gives off CO2 into the atmosphere. Okay, so the... Um, yeah, so this is, this is kind of like showing that. So in the surface ocean, we're, we're basically removing carbon. Okay? So you can see we've got, in this case, we're, um, we've got an axis at the bottom. Carbon is expressed as parts per million of carbon, which is equivalent to the total inorganic carbon in um, uh, moles per meter cubed. I mean, it's a really weird unit, but it doesn't really matter. Okay. But you can see that um, in the surface ocean, we have, it doesn't matter kind of whether in the within Atlantic or the Pacific, okay, because the ocean is in contact with the atmosphere, Henry's law is determining what the, the concentration of CO2 dissolved in the ocean is, and therefore it's also determining what the uh, total inorganic carbon concentration is. Okay. You might get small differences if you have small differences in pH in the surface ocean, because that will determine how much of the CO2 is in CO2 and how much of it is in the other carbon species. But basically life then uses up some of that carbon, okay, and forms organic matter. Now in the surface ocean that carbon is then replenished from the atmosphere relatively rapidly, so we don't deplete the carbon in the surface ocean down all the way over to zero. Okay, it stays at this value near the equilibrium concentration of the atmosphere. But we start adding carbon to the deep ocean, okay, so this, the values down here are higher than up here, and that's because organic matter is sinking down from the surface ocean and then uh, releasing that carbon as all the organic matter is respired by bacteria. 
Now, one thing you can see on this is that the concentration in the Atlantic Ocean is a little bit less than the Pacific Ocean. And if you think back to that conveyor kind of diagram, okay, it, the Pacific Ocean is further along that conveyor of that circulation of deep water. So that means that it's, it's been water in the Atlantic kind of starts off around kind of Iceland, it sinks to the bottom, and then starts moving south through the Atlantic Ocean. Okay? So it's not been down there very long compared to the water that's in the deep Pacific Ocean that formed in the North Atlantic, went down to the bottom, okay? down all the way through the, the Atlantic, okay? around kind of the, the Southern Ocean, then up into the Pacific. Okay? So the water in the Pacific, you can think of it as being older in that it was in contact with the atmosphere a lot longer ago than the deep water in the Pacific. So it's had longer for kind of organic matter in the surface ocean to kind of like rain down into it. So it's had a longer integrated flux of carbon into the, the deep ocean. So that's why the Pacific water has got a higher dissolved in organic carbon content and also a lower pH. Okay, so that's, uh, that's kind of showing here. So if you look at the total dissolved in organic carbon kind of in this region of the, the ocean, in the deep ocean, it's a little bit less than it is in the ocean over here. Okay? And that's because it's been down there longer. Okay, so to kind of summarize, 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 summarize that bit, okay? Deep circulation of water is important for determining how long stuff has been down there um, uh, because the Biology that happens in the surface ocean takes carbon from the surface ocean and puts it into the deep ocean. So the longer water has been down there, uh, the more carbon it can accumulate. Okay. Okay. So in the um, the 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 key thing here is that if you want to take carbon out of the atmosphere and store it in the the whole ocean, because you can really consider that the deep ocean is really what matters for storing most of the, the carbon because it's so much bigger than the surface ocean. Okay? So the, this thing, the, the dissolution rate, so how quickly the ocean interacts with the, the atmosphere, that's actually really, really fast. So that won't really change. That's not so important. It's these things here. So if we, if we slow down the ocean circulation, Okay, so if we slow down how fast that thing circulates, the water will be down in the deep ocean for a lot longer before it gets a chance to upwell and give up back its carbon to the atmosphere, which means it can, have, it can accumulate more carbon. Okay? Likewise, if we increase the amount of biology that happens in the surface ocean, okay, that means that the flux of carbon from the surface ocean to the deep ocean will be greater. So for any one water mass age, okay, it will have a higher dissolved in organic carbon concentration. So these things, changes in these through geological time, so if we make change how the ocean circulates, change how effective the biological pump is, so that's pumping carbon from the surface ocean to the deep ocean, okay, by the bacteria kind of like, well, by, by plankton and, and animals kind of living in the surface ocean and then sinking and dying to the deep ocean. So if we can increase the, the efficiency of that at any point in time, that means we can take more carbon out of the atmosphere and put it in the deep ocean. Okay? So this, these, these processes have a really important role in determining how much carbon is in the atmosphere and how much is stored in the deep ocean. Okay? Because if you can change the uh, amount of carbon stored in the deep ocean by, say, 1%, okay? so 1% of 38,000, Okay, is 300 and something or thousand. 300 and something, yeah? That's half the concentration, half the, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. So small changes in the efficiency of these processes can have big impacts for the atmospheric concentration. Okay? And hence... Okay, so we're just going to talk a little bit about this buffering capacity. Okay? So the first experiment I did here, okay, you see it changed... Like quite quite easily, yeah. So this, I mean, this is still this is pink. This is like yellow. Okay. So we, by adding the CO2, we acidified the water, kind of very easily. Yeah. So on on that diagram there, by adding CO2, we started out at pH what was it six point something. Okay. We added CO2, and it changed it super rapidly. Okay. 
So I'm going to get some different water now. So this was tap water from a tap. And this is um, finest mineral water from the KB shop. So um, I'm just going to rinse out my uh, thingy, jubilee box hits. Um, Um, so I'm going to put so exactly the same experiment. Added CO2 to this, okay. The pH hasn't changed much. We can put another little guy. Um, okay, you can see the pH has changed a little bit. It's gone, it's gone down maybe half a pH unit. Okay, so it's not gone down as much as before. Okay, I also wouldn't trust those pH units to save my life, but um, I'm sure they're fine for your practicals. But. Okay. So what's happened here is that there's stuff in the KB water okay, that has basically stopped the pH changing as much. Okay? So tap water doesn't have this magic stuff in, but KB mineral water does. Okay? And this is what we're, we're um, looking at here. We're looking at basically this system has um, a quite a high buffering capacity. So if we look at the mineral content of this water, it's got lots of stuff in it. Okay, so tap water is just water. This has got calcium, sodium. It's got bicarbonate in it. Okay? So it already has uh, lots of dissolved inorganic carbon in it. Okay? Um, and it's, it has lots of that dissolved inorganic carbon in it. Um, and what that, the effect of that is that if, imagine if you had lots of this in your, your water already, okay, and then you tried to acidify the water, okay, if you tried to, to add hydrogen ions, okay, because you have lots of these carbon species in, if you added a hydrogen ion, what it would do is it would combine with that hydrogen ion to form kind of CO2, and it would, it would regi re regist, blah, resist the change in pH. Okay? So waters that have got a high alkalinity Okay, and to, to, to keep these guys in solution and stop them turning into CO2 and degassing, the water has these calcium, magnesium, has these bunch of uh, uh, elements dissolved in it that can react with these species to stop them, um, to basically to keep them in their carbonate um, and bicarbonate state. So waters that have got lots of dissolved ions in them, okay, and particularly carbonate and bicarbonate, have this really high buffering capacity. Okay? So we call this buffering capacity the alkalinity. Uh, hopefully it's on the next slide. Okay, so um, it's not, but uh, so the, the alkalinity is the capacity of a solution to, to buffer the addition of an acid. Okay? 
In this case, the acid we're adding is carbonic acid when the CO2 reacted with the, uh, with the water. Okay, and we can kind of see um, the kind of the effect of that in kind of the ocean is because the ocean is not just kind of uh, an isolated kind of basin of water. It's kind of it's got lots of things that have got carbonate in them and calcium. Okay, so it's basically you can think of the ocean as being a, a basin of water that's lined with limestone. Okay, it's got lots and lots of kind of shells and um, actually it's got kind of lots of limestone kind of in the the, 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 the shells of, of organisms that are actually living in the ocean. And it, this means that when you raise the um, atmospheric CO2 concentration, and that's what's happening in the top panel here through time. Okay, so the red is the atmospheric concentration of CO2. The blue, the top blue line is actually the concentration of CO2 dissolved in the water. Okay, you see that tracks the atmospheric. Now, um, that causes the pH to go down, okay, because we're, 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 adding, um, we're adding hydrogen ions to the water. But what happens as the pH goes down, okay, it's kind of, this change is not as big as it would have been if there wasn't already these carbonate species dissolved in the ocean. So that inhibits the, the change in pH. And also, if we start to lower the pH, that makes these, these shells, these tests of foraminifera, okay, the types of marine plankton. You, you've, you've, you've seen experiments where you've taken um, acid and you've added it to, to carbonate and it's gone fizz. Uh, that's the carbonate dissolving. Okay? And as it dissolves, we're making the ocean more acidic. We're dissolving these carbonate species, these, carb these calcium carbonates. That dissolution of calcium carbonates <coughs> adds calcium ions and it adds um, uh, bicarbonate ions into the ocean. Okay? So that increases the ocean's ability to, to be able to buffer the acid. Okay? So by adding acid to the ocean, we start to dissolve these lovely shells, and that increases the ocean's ability to soak up that, those hydrogen ions. So the, the ocean is kind of trying to look after itself. In the, the, by the CO2 we put into the ocean, we put it in the atmosphere, then it goes into the ocean, then these kind of shells start dissolving, releasing more alkalinity into the ocean, okay? So releasing more um, carbonate and bicarbonate um, and more calcium ions, and that increases the ability of the ocean to deal with this pH change. So if that didn't happen, we'd be in a much worse state than we are, because if the pH changed a lot when we added CO2 to the oceans, that would allow the proportions of, C of the, the components of dissolved inorganic carbon, the um, CO2, the bicarbonate, the carbonate, that would start to favour there being much more CO2 dissolved, which would mean there would be much more of that enormous carbon pool which could interact with the atmosphere. So it, this is basically stopping that process happening. Okay, so this is, this is kind of like a, kind of a word summary of that. So the alkalinity is basically the ability of the, 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 the liquid, in the case of the ocean, to absorb those hydrogen ions Okay, and you can kind of really, a, a really simple, simple, simplified version of what happens is this equation in the middle where you have some, let's say, calcium carbonate, okay? Okay, and if you add acid to that, that mops up one of those hydrogen ions and produces calcium and bicarbonate, okay? Um, there's, a, there's a more um, kind of rigorous definition of, the, of carbonate alkalinity, which is the sum of these two components where this guy is times two, because it's got a charge of, of two minus that allows it to, to mop up uh, two hydrogen ions. Um, but basically, I mean, this is the kind of the thing to remember down at the bottom. If we increase the carbon dioxide <coughs> concentration in the atmosphere, we increase the total amount of dissolved inorganic carbon. Okay? That will cause there to be more hydrogen ions. Okay? Okay? That, that promotes the dissolution of carbonates through this, this reaction up here. We add this, that makes that dissolve more. Okay? Um, so that increases the alkalinity, okay? which increases the ability of the ocean. We add these guys okay, to the ocean. That means that we are increasing the ability for mopping up other hydrogen ions. Okay? So it's kind of a self-healing system. Okay, so it, it kind of is one of the reasons why the, the pH of the ocean is actually quite hard to shift the pH, pH of the ocean from around this value kind of between 7 and 8. 
okay, which is really fortunate. Because if that didn't happen, we'd be in deep doos. Okay, so um, so just to kind of like finish off the, the, the carbon cycle in the ocean, we've got to consider kind of the ultimate out flux. Okay, so we've got this flux into the ocean, into the, the ocean and atmosphere system by us burning fossil fuels. And on the long term, that might be kind of the analogous to the uh, emissions of volcanic gases. So very, very slow geological processes. Ultimately, okay, we remove uh, carbon into deep sediments. Okay? But this is a really, really, really long process. So to fix the problem that we're kind of pumping loads of CO2 out into the atmosphere, ultimately, over very, very long geological timescales, that carbon will be go to the ocean and then will form deep sea sediments. But that takes an extraordinarily long amount of time. Okay, so um, to conclude, um, biology and the, the taking of carbon from the surface ocean down into the deep ocean is in really important for determining how much carbon you can store in the whole ocean. Okay, and that's kind of also affected by how fast the ocean circulates, which is basically how long you can isolate the deep ocean from the surface ocean. Because as soon as you can, the deep ocean gets to the surface, it will release all of that stored CO2 back out again. Okay? Um, and we also have this, this carbonate system. Okay, so this is basically when CO2 dissolves in seawater, it apportions into those different species. CO2, bicarbonate, and carbonate ions. And that, that has... Now one effect of that is that we can isolate most of the carbon away from the atmosphere by, by keeping it in these... Um, ionic forms which can't interact with the atmosphere, which is great. Um, but it also has this buffering capacity. So by having these different forms of carbon, switching between the proportions of one and the other, that mops up additional hydrogen ions so it can mediate some of the ocean acidification that happens when we do put lots of CO2 into the atmosphere. And ocean acidification is really important because the more acidic the oceans are, not only will that reduce the capacity of the ocean to store carbon, because more of it will be able to interact with the atmosphere, but it also makes it hard for organisms that do grow shells, okay, to grow, to, to survive and live. So it changes the whole kind of marine food web thing, which is kind of bad if you, you know, eat fish, um, which, you know, are tasty. <laughs>